collieries and key people behind that. So we'll make a start. <clears throat> First, I, <clears throat> I'd like to give you some three important references. There are many more, but uh, these, sorry, there's four. Uh, <clears throat> one, the Wigan Pier and Illustrated History by John Hannaway and Jack Winston Lee in 1985. There are a lot of really good photographs in there, particularly of the many tipplers along the, along the canal. Second one is the Industrial Railways of Wigan Coldfield, part one, west and south of Wigan, by Townley, Peden, and uh, Smith. That's an incredibly detailed, uh, well-researched book on uh, railways uh, south and west of Wigan. So if you need more details than I can give you today, you might be interested in, in looking at that. The third one is uh, Donald Anderson's The Oral Coalfield from uh, 1740 to 1850. And uh, lastly, uh, Joyce Banks of Winston Lee Hall, who in 1962 published a paper on a 19th century colliery railway. To start off, just with some general photographs of uh, Wigan Pier and the canal, just to make sure we're all uh, on board where, what we're going to talk about. Uh, this is one by Andy Lomax, he sent me the other day, looking uh, down towards the pier here in Trencherfield with the, uh, what was the Orwell pub, which is now part of the redevelopment area of, uh, around Wigan Pier. Another view of the Wigan Pier with the statue of a sad looking guy chained to the fence. I'm not sure what, what he did to be chained to the fence, but there we are. This is a painting by Renoir, a semi-impressionist, done in 1980. That was actually the one that I did. Uh, and I did it to try and reflect the atmosphere that I saw along the canal and the warehouses in, in the 1950s and 60s when I was growing up, before all the redevelopment. The famous picture I think Claire has behind her is the picture of the Tippler uh, tipping coal from a coal wagon with the name Winstonly on it, uh, tipping its coal into the canal barge. And of course, all the canal, canal coal went uh, along the canal to Liverpool and out from Liverpool. The background piece of a graphic, those who see my presentation on the early railways west of Wigan, particularly Clark's Railway, We'll have seen this already, but it tries to put in perspective the development of Wigan, very slow development from Roman times up to about 1750, when we started seeing the origins of the Industrial Revolution, uh, when coal production uh, started to increase rapidly up to a peak uh, about the start of World War II. And of course, now we don't have any coal mines in the area at all. But during this same time, the population, population of Wigan also skyrocketed from just a few thousand up to you know, perhaps around 90,000 that it is today. So it also makes you wonder what sort of graph you might see if you were 1,000, 2,000 years ahead, looking back, what's, what's going to happen in this time? So the Industrial Revolution really changed Wigan from being an um, important market town with many artisans making clocks and pewter and iron goods and, and uh, other, uh, other industries, uh, artisan industries, to being a major industrial uh, town, which transformed not only Wiganers, but the landscape around Wigan. Uh, up here, we've got the uh, women who did many years ago work in the coal mines together with children. The flashes caused by subsidence from the coal mining the spoil heaps were all the, the waste from the collieries, and this is the waste from Pemberton Colliery, Blundell's Pemberton Colliery. Um, the uh, iron and steel works at Kirkless, and of course, a lot of cotton mills. So it's at this time, at the start of this transformation of Wigan, that we'll be talking about the, the origins of Wigan Pier. Again, anybody who's seen my railway presentation will also have seen this, but I thought it good to give you all some perspective um, of the geographic locations we'll be talking about. So we've got Central Wigan here, 
the River Douglas coming down from the north and curling back up to the northwest through Crook and Gathurst onto the River Ribble. And then we have the Leeds and Liverpool Canal coming down the flight of locks into Wigan with the um, Lee Canal linking with the Duke of Bridgewater's Canal opened in uh, 1825. That follows very closely the route of the Douglas Canal through Gathurst and, and onwards. All these others are individual colliery railways that were developed at this part of, of Wigan area, starting with these up here in the 1770s. I think one of the first was Jackson's Railway. He had a colliery just about here. Um, and had a, had a little railway down to the um, Douglas Navigation. Uh, he was a, actually a, made his money as a watchmaker in Wigan. And then uh, uh, Blundell took it over and developed his own railway. Uh, I can't go through them all in detail, but number four here was uh, Hustler's Railway from near Billinge Hill all the way down to Canal. Uh, number three was Clark's Railway. He uh, started buying property down near the canal in the 1790s, bought more land and coal rights up in Pemberton. Then in 1792, uh, leased land under Winston Estate here from Merrick Banks for a 20 year lease. And then in 2012, he developed another 20 year lease to develop the coal down in uh, near Longshire. And this was the route where the walking horse that Clark built and was operating in 1813. It operated all along this line, transporting coal from Winstonley down, down to the canal. That, that walking horse was the third commercially successful steam locomotive anywhere in the world. So it's, there's quite a bit of history behind some of these. And all these colliery railways were predecessors to the mainline railways. Mainline railway uh, came into Wigan from the south near Parkside about 19, sorry, 1832, I think. And then extended up to Preston two years later, 1834. And then subsequently, the uh, line was built through Wigan out to Southport and the line from Wigan to Liverpool through Pemberton and Holland. The particular railways we'll be talking about most, uh, number eight, six, and seven. Uh, number six is Blundell's Railway. This is where you saw the photograph of the spoil heap. It's on just here on what was the Pemberton collieries um, area. So Blundell started developing these collieries in 1815 and then expanded them to come down. This line went to Fireman's Pit, which was on uh, what today is Holmes, Holmes House Lane, I believe. Then he developed other railways uh, to in Highfield going across the railway, and then one down here to Tampic Cottages. Uh, as you'll talk, as you'll see later when I talk about the uh, Blundell's railway head on the canal, it's it's this railway coming from Pemberton Collieries across the bottom of uh, Bellinge Road down Victoria Street, and that's why Victoria Street is so straight. It was an old railway line. And this went to uh, the canal near Seven Stars Bridge. Number eight was German's collieries. Uh, German had developed coal mines from the 1790s and expanded like Blundell did uh, in the 1820s. And he also built a railway parallel to Blundell's railway down to the canal. Uh, they never shared the railway. <laughs> and uh, the Blundells, uh, would never allow the Bankses to share the railway either. So they're very independent operators. Number seven is uh, Winstonley Colliery railway line owned by the Bankses. So 
it started off, I'll give you more details on this later, but it started off around here and Stonehouse on Warrington Lane, down to the pier head at Wigan, and gradually extended backwards. And as Squire Banks, Merrick Banks wanted to expand his coal mining in the early 1830s, he built uh, coal pits just here. If you come up from Pony Dake at Well Brow, those of you who know it, the, his first colliery was number one, opposite the entrance to what today is uh, Holmes House Drive. And he also developed a little railway, it must have been a, a horse and cart railway from number one pit to, where am I? Straight across the Winstonley Hall. Then he built number two pit just at the top of Wellbrow, then number 1830, 1834, and Baxter's pit uh, by the side of today's beach walk in, uh, later in the 1830s. And then in 1840s, 43, I think, uh, developed uh, Windy Arbor Colliery, which was his number four pit. Subsequent to this, later on in 1888, Winston the Collieries, who had taken over ownership of uh, Banks's Winston the Colliery, is an independent uh, company, Ex developed a, a new coal mine down in Leyland Green, which is uh, down towards Sims Lane Ends. And any of you know that about a mile south of Windy Arbor down here, which I'll be talking about further. Uh, so that yeah, gives you the bit of a historical and geographical background to the more detailed information that I'll be presenting. Of course, Wigan Pier became famous from the music hall jokes and songs of uh, George Formby Sr., who was also known as the Wigan Nightingale, I believe, and his son, George Formby. And I understand we're celebrating his 60th year since his passing this year. He died in uh, eight, uh, 1961. He was born in Wigan in uh, 1904 as George Hey, Hoy, Booth. Uh, both of these developed many jokes and musicals about Wigan Pier, and uh, George Formby, of course, appeared in many films as well. Back in the 30s before the war, he was the best paid entertainer in, in the whole of England. I'll tell you a little story associated with this. Um, He's dressed here in army uniform. He actually went over to Normandy, arrived there in July 1944. And I've seen estimates that he, he entertained maybe some 3 million people all the time he spent, mainly service people, all the time he spent in Europe. But about 20 years ago, I was at a conference in New Orleans. And one morning, I had a couple of hours spare, so I decided to get on a an old paddle boat on the Mississippi River. I thought it would be nice to take a leisurely cruise up and down the Mississippi River. So I got on, it was November, uh, pretty cold and not many people on. There were six or eight people on the lower deck. So I went up to the upper deck and I could hear some music. And there was a guy sitting on a bench uh, playing a ukulele. So I listened to his music for a while and then started talking to him. I asked him where he'd learned to play the ukulele. And he said, when he was in the services in Europe, he said, somebody by the name of George Formby taught him. <laughs> so for the next hour, I was listening to all George Formby's songs, you know, standing on the lamppost and all the others, sailing up and down the Mississippi on an old river boat. So that was quite a nice event. The, one of the alleged origins of the term Wigan Pier comes from from about 1890, 1991, when a train coming out of uh, Walgate Station, I think towards Southport, uh, stopped at some signals outside Wigan. And uh, there, was a, there was an old uh, tramway uh, and someone asked, where the hell are we? And somebody said, well, it's Wigan Pier. Of course, Wigan's not on the seaside, but that's, that's one of the interpretations in, of the origin of, of the joke of Wigan Pier. So there's two possibilities of what the pier could have been. 
So this shows a map from Newtown collieries across the marshy area, across the River Douglas, across the canal into Meadows Colliery. So Lamb and Moore, who operated the colliery, built this upper tramway. So one of the interpretations is when the train was stuck up here, they looked back and could see this pier-like structure and they said, oh, it's, you know, it's Wigan Pier. Another interpretation, and keep your eye on this railway line here on the next map. Oh, sorry, before that, there's, I find just one photograph of that old uh, gantry from Newtown to Meadow Colliery across the uh, canal. Uh, it's in the book that Gordon Cook wrote on the history of Highfield St. Matthews. And he, this photograph shows the people from Highfield St. Matthews on a boat trip underneath the gantry there. So that's probably uh, what people initially termed Wigan Pier. The other possible interpretation, if, so we've been talking up here before, and I showed you that other branch of the railway coming down here. This is a railway from Wigan Wallgate down through Pemberton to, to Liverpool. So this was initially um, built on wooden trestles. And Mike Clark, who's an expert on the canal, suggests this might have been a similar structure. This was the one up in church. Uh, th this was demolished in the 1920s. But he, he thinks that that original stretch of the railway was built on these huge trestles like this. So another interpretation for Wigan Pier could have the, been the people on the stuck on the train looking further back and seeing this and said, that's Wigan Pier. And in 1936, George Orwell uh, visited Wigan and he wanted to find out about conditions in uh, industrial areas in Northern England. He spent time in Wigan and then went over to, to Yorkshire. And it, it's, it's very interesting. I find it interesting reading his book, The Road to Wigan Pier, which was published in 1937. He always said he wanted to be like one of the Wiganers, but he, he never quite was that well accepted. He always felt like a foreigner. But he really admired the work of coal miners. He said uh, if he had to work down a coal mine, he probably wouldn't survive three weeks. And he, he appreciated the workers and the hard, harsh working conditions, but he disliked the mechanization aspects of industrial revolution and its effects on, on the landscape. So the George Orwell's Road to Wigan Pier became the second major uh, popular source of reference to a Wigan Pier. So we know it was a, a road, we know it was a railroads, and the question is to Wigan Pier, it must have come from somewhere. Where did it start? So a lot of what I'll be talking about documents where the Wigan Pier Railway started. So going back to the start of the Industrial Revolution, um, coal, coal has been mined in the Wigan area for many centuries, um, back to at least the 1500s. But it was all transported by horse and cart, pretty primitive uh, laborious ways of transporting coal around. But they did take coal from the Wigan area by horse and cart to places like Warrington and Preston quite a long way. Uh, Sinclair, who I think was Wigan librarian, he wrote his excellent book on the history of Wigan in 1882, recognized that none of the local resources have been developed, but there was not much motivation for them to make substantial changes. So th this is a graphic summary of key timelines and the development of the transport systems relevant to Wigan Pier and Dock. So number one, we start with the Douglas navigation back in 1741 when the navigation was opened. Uh, the dock, as I'll show you in the map, was on uh, off Pottery Road. Number two was the road to Wigan Pier initially uh, operated through Clarton, Daglish, Brimlow, Daglish uh, consortiums, and I'll say more about that. Number three 
uh, was the uh, Germans Pier. I mentioned the German collieries in Newtown and Billings Road that went down to the canal near Seven Stars Bridge. Number four is Blundell's Railway that I mentioned, also going down the canal by Seven Stars Bridge. And sec uh, fifthly, that wooden viaduct I showed you uh, on the Wigan to Liverpool Railway, that was built about six, 1848 and filled into an embankment about 1890. And that Number six was that uh, overhead tubway from Newton Colliery to Meadows Colliery. And of course, we had the Leeds Liverpool Canal, which was open from Wigan uh, to Liverpool in 1780. It already having been open from Liverpool to Gathurst in 1774. So in 1720, they tried to pass uh, Douglas Navigation Act. Again, there was an apparent lack of enthusiasm and initiative and perhaps money for doing much about it for quite a few years. And in 1737, Alexander Lee and his father-in-law, Robert Holt, I think that's the same Holt as the Holt Arms, at the, the foot of the causeway in, in Billinge. They, they began to move things rather rapidly to make the River Douglas nav navigable from Wigan to the Ribble Estuary and they built locks and canal sections and cut some weirs to aid the navigation. It opened in 1741 and that allowed the boats to carry some 20 tons of coal and other goods up to the Ribble Estuary. So this was a big step forward compared with the horse and cart that everybody had to rely on before. And that, on a national perspective, I think it's, it's important to remember that this was when deeper coal mining started to be opened up in Wigan. Wigan, of course, was a landlocked. It didn't have any direct outlet to the sea to market coal, even when it was mined. In other parts of the country, particularly in the Great Northern coal field, Newcastle area, they were already exporting several million tons of coal a year down in boats from Tyneside, Wearside, to, to London and Amsterdam and other places. So Wigan really was backwards because of its uh, landlocked position. An interesting find was that Whitaker um, in his report in 1755, he said when the navigation was being constructed, there was a lot of evidence found for a major battle between what he said was Britons and Saxons. He said that the battle was probably fought in the marshy Parsons Meadow area on the south side of the River Douglas. Um, what they found was a lot of human and horse bones and spurs and military pieces uh, all along the course of the channel from the termination of the dock to the point of Pool Bridge, which must have been in Pool Stock area. Uh, we have no more evidence of these pieces uh, and there's obviously different interpretations of what they represent, whether it were, indeed was from the Britons and Saxons era, era we were not sure. Okay, starting in 1802, we have a fairly detailed map of the conditions around the canal basin. This is a canal survey map that Mike Clark uh, provided. You're more used to seeing this with the east-west canal running here. It, on this map, it's actually running north-south. So imagine it tipped around coming east-west uh, through the Wigan Pier area. So in 1802, we see a lot of these names. These are the Burgesses, the land areas uh, allocated to the Burgesses of Wigan. Um, we see the canal basin running down here to Seven Stars Bridge and then moving to the Northwest. We also see two channels, straight channels coming from, <clears throat> there are buildings here at the head of these channels and there are potteries either side. So we're not exactly sure what these represent. Uh, one interpretation is that the Douglas Navigation actually came up this way 
and this was the terminus of the Douglas navigation. Uh, Bill Aldridge uh, thinks that these could also possibly have been outlets from these factories and or outlets to keep excess water discharging from the canal basin. So we're not quite sure what they were. Uh, interestingly, down at Seven Stars Bridge here, both sides of the Seven Stars Bridge, you see coal yards. So this will be where the horses and carts uh, presumably brought coal down from the mines and dumped it into uh, the, the canal here before the railways were built. Another possible interpretation on this, uh, if you see this uh, right angle bend in the canal, that's somewhat unusual to find a sharp bend in a canal like that. So one interpretation is that the connection, this the canal basin was made into a basin for the navigation back in the 1740s. So it could have been that the navigation followed an old cut, which is the same path as the later 1780 canal. Alternatively, there's one suggestion that the canal basin actually came more this way and joined the Douglas further down here. So we see a lot of interesting information on here, but with a lot of uncertainties on the interpretation. Uh, this building, this is opposite where the Lee Canal comes out into the Wigan Basin. This, this building, the stone building, was built in 1780, I believe. And the warehouses were quite a lot later than that. Wigan Pier number one building at the head of the uh, canal was, I believe, built in 1825. So this, this will be the oldest surviving building from the 1780s. So the Leeds and Liverpool Canal Act was passed in 1770. Uh, both Holt Lee, uh, son of Alexander Lee and Jonathan Blundell were key players in the development of the canal. Douglas Navigation was purchased from the Douglas Navigation Company from Alexander Lee in 1771. So the, Douglas Navigation people could already see the writing on the wall when the canal was built. It was the Douglas Navigation wasn't going to be as important after that. So the canal opened in 1774 uh, down to Gathurst and included an extension of the canal through the Douglas Navigation from Dean into Wigan. 1776, the canal section from Dean to Wigan was authorized in 1780. 1780, the Seven Stars Bridge uh, was built, and that stone building that I showed you was built at the same time. 1794, uh, the Wigan to Dean section of the canal took over from the navigation. So horse-drawn barges along the canal could now up, transport up to 60 tons of goods along the canal. So again, showing the much greater efficiency of transporting coal from the mines. 1820, the Wigan to Lee branch opened, linking it with the Bridgewater Canal and a much broader canal network. Uh, I mentioned the end warehouse, Wigan Pier No. 1, as it's called, um, was built around 1825. So we're beginning to get into the Banks' Winstonley side of, of the uh, jigsaw puzzle. This is Merrick Banks. Bank, Merrick Banks was born Merrick Hall uh, when William Banks of Winstonley Hall died in 1800. He didn't have any male heirs, so uh, the estate and hall were passed to his cousin, who was Thomas Holm of Holland House in Apollon. Thomas Holm died in 1803. And it came to his son, Merrick Holm, to change his name from Merrick Holm to Merrick Banks in order to take possession of the estate and hall 
in 1804. So this is Merritt Banks Sr. You'll see his son later uh, is also called Merritt Banks. We'll call him Merritt Banks II. Merritt Banks died in 1827. This is obviously an aerial view of Winstonley Hall. So Merrick Banks owned those Stonehouse colliery mines uh, that I showed you coming down one side of Warrington Lane. And he, in 1822, he leased the coal rights to a Thomas Clawton. Clawton is often stated to be the builder of the Wigan Pier. In fact, contracted with various parties for a pier head on the canal. But in the same year, he sold a portion of his mines and mineral rights to John de Gleish, who was brother of Robert de Gleish, who built the walking horse that I mentioned back in Winstonley and Oral. John de Gleish entered into a partnership with Peter Brimelow, who died in 1837. He was a coal master of Wigan. And both of them entered into a partnership to operate Stonehouse Colliery. So a bit of information on Thomas Clawton. He was a Warrington solicitor, uh, salt maker and coal mining speculator, uh, emphasis being on speculator because he went bankrupt in 1824. Let me just read you a little piece here about Clawton. Uh, Clawton married Maria, who was a legitimate daughter of Thomas Legg or Lee, let's say Thomas Lee of Lime Hall. Um, they lived in Haydock Lodge. In 1812, he'd agreed to purchase Newstead Estate in Not Nottinghamshire, which was the home of Lord Byron and his ancestors. However, he was unable to complete the purchase and forfeited 25,000 pounds, which was probably a couple of million in those days. And he was, as I mentioned, he was declared bankrupt in 1824. But he had an interesting son, Thomas, who became professor of poetry at Oxford University and later became uh, Bishop of St. Albans. So Thomas Clawton was is actually buried in Lee Chapel in uh, Wigan Parish Church. So you might ask what happened to Haydock Hall? Well, in 1944, it was opened as a lunatic asylum and quickly became the largest pauper house outside London. And they said one of the reasons for building the lunatic asylum on pauper house there was because of the easy access by railway from different parts of the country to bring them in. So Merritt Banks II, who took over the estate um, in 1827, is depicted here in front of Winstonley Hall. This will be Merritt Banks II with his dogs. Uh, this will be William Starkey, who was the owner of what was called the favorite pony, the horse and jockey, I'm sorry, the, the horse and jockey and the pony dick. This was P Squire Banks' horse, Pony Dick. So William Starkey later changed the name of the pub at Pony Dick to the favorite pony inn. So a bit of history on the Banks family, James Banks, purchased Winstonley Estate and Hall from Edmund Winstonley in 1595-6. We already know that coal was mined on Winstonley Estate uh, back in the 1500s. James Banks was interesting. He was a Wiganer who made his money as a goldsmith and uh, banker in London. So he then came back up to the Wigan area and he, in 1581, before he bought Winstonley Hall, purchase the area around uh, Stonehouse Colliery. <laughs> that he, the Banks family kept that until 1657 when they sold it to, to other people. So when Merrick Banks the first bought the Stonehouse area back in 1822, 
he brought the Stonehouse area back into the Banks family after a couple of hundred years. So back in the 1700s, William Banks, who died without a male heir, started leasing coal to coal developers such as John Clark, and Blundell, etc., and made a fortune. Um, and it, when, when the Banks estate was combined with the home estate, so the collieries, uh, Winstonley, Apolland and Oral, were all combined into one bigger complex. So they realized with a lot of money, they could do a lot of things. So both Merrick Banks Senior and Junior went on big spending sprees, landscaping the estate, building the wall around the estate, expanding the hall. They bought Bispam Hall. They also bought an 84,000 acre estate in Scotland, in Perthshire. They had their own boat uh, operating from Liverpool to take them up to Scotland and to go salmon fishing in, Scot in Iceland, etc. It makes you wonder with all this money where it went to and why some of it couldn't have stayed and helped maintain the hall from the 1950s onwards, but that's another story. So after they made money leasing the coal under Winston Estate to other people, Merrick II decided to develop his own collieries and initially built pit one that I mentioned opposite where home house drives uh, intersects the, the road there. A pit two, just a hundred yards further up. Pit three, what we know as Baxter's Pit, by the side of uh, Beach Hill Walk in 1834, and then up to Windy Arbor uh, uh, in about 1837, and then 50, 20, 20 years later, New Pit, which was behind what today is Gleed Wood. But the trouble is that he was developing all these pits, but he didn't have a railway to market these goods. He must have, for, for uh, 20, 30 years, he must still have been marketing his goods by horse and cart. But he decided to do something about that. So going back to the origins of Wigan Pier itself, it's often stated, as I, as I said, that Thomas Clotten, built Wigan Pier. He did not build Wigan Pier. He contracted with people to build it, but went bankrupt and didn't build it. So we've seen that the only, the rights for the coal mines around Stonehouse Colliery moved over to John Daglish. And from the Lancashire Record Office, it says John Daglish hath made and erected a weighing machine, a pierhead and a tippler upon or near the banks of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal in Wigan. That was 1822. So Merrick Banks continued his desire to extend or develop and extend railways from Winstonley down to the canal. So in 1844, he actually bought the rights to develop a railway all the way down from uh, Windy Arbor, where he actually owned the land himself. But going down from like Goose Green down to the canal, he had to deal with six or seven other landowners to, to get the rights to build his railway. But he did this, he completed that in 1844, and he actually purchased the pier in 1850. So this is an 1848 Ordnance Survey map. This is the German and Banks's colliery railroads coming down Victoria Street down to the pier. So Germans colliery actually went to the north of the Seven Stars Bridge and Banks's railroad came to the south of the bridge. They were built about 1825 and 1827. They were always horse drawn. You see, this, you see much development, obviously industrial development by 1848 compared with the 1802 map. A lot of cotton mills, chemical works, uh, uh, foundry. What you see down here is the road from Stonehouse Colliery and then further back up to Windy Arbor, bringing coal from Winston the Collieries down to the canal at Wigan Pier. 
Uh, Joyce Banks uh, has a beautiful drawing in, in her paper on a dandy cart. So um, for decades, the only way of moving coal down from Winston to the canal was, was horse and cart. It was a drop of nearly 300 feet. So a lot of it was by uh, using brakemen to control the carts and by two inclined planes where they, they had counterbalances of the heavy coal laden wagons slipping down one section and at the same time transporting the empty wagons back up to towards Windy Arbor. But the dandy cart was where the horses used to get a free ride going down to the canal. So the a couple of horses would get in here and get a ride down to the canal. Of course, back up, coming back up from the canal, the horses had to earn their oats and they'd have to carry the empty wagons back up. Baxter pit that I mentioned um, ended uh, production in, I've forgotten the date, it was before 1970, 1960, I think. So this was the actual Baxter pit head uh, photograph that my brother took in 1970. And looking down the Baxter pit shaft before it was uh, covered in uh, by 1980. Another interesting photograph taken from Winstonley, looking across the fields. These are the Blundell slag heaps that I showed you, Pemberton Colliery. Obviously in Winstonley, so they used to get the name the Wigan Alps when they're beautifully covered in, in snow. But this photograph was taken from, from here at the site of what today is that little Winstonley shopping precinct. So if you know the precinct, there's two sides, so the shops either side of a central a little roadway, which is this section here. So that is where uh, the little Winston, the shopping precinct was built, either side of this road going down to the canal. This is Winston, the colliery uh, up near uh, uh, Windy Arbor, number four pit. That closed in 1979, eventually. It, it went into private ownership after the bank's uh, railway company was dissolved in the 1920s. But these are the stocks that are pretty famous up near Windy Arbor. And I understand in the last year or so, the, these have been renovated as a, uh, as a historical monument. I mentioned the Leyland Green Pit, which is near Sims Lane Ends. Uh, it was a a uh, pit that was sunk in 1888 and operated to 1927. And the railway was built from Leyland Green, feeding into the Winstonley line uh, down to the canal. This is a photograph by Peden in his, his book on railways south and west of Wigan. It shows a flagman's hut in Goose Green, where the Winstonley coal line crossed Warrington Road that's road, not rail. Um, so the flagman would have to control the traffic as the trains transported the coal down to the canal. So let's go through how the mode of transport of coal changed over these uh, decades and century. Initially, there were wooden railways on wooden rails and the, there were the coal was taken down to the canal and uh, fed by just the power of gravity and horsepower. And as I mentioned, in some cases, inclined planes, all on narrow gauge railroads of four foot uh, railroads. So when did they introduce steam locomotives? Well, Winston the Colliery only introduced mainline steam locomotives in 1878, which was 65 years after Daglish operated the walking horse, also in Winstonley. So I think one of the features of Winstonley's colour is that they were pretty slow in adapting to modern technological changes. Uh, Blundell, on the other hand, on Pemberton Collieries, operated uh, his mainline steam locomotives starting from about 1848 when the Wigan to Liverpool line was opened and came through Pemberton. He, uh, he connected with that. 
you see the difference in size of operations between Blundell's and Winston Lee Colliery. As far as I can see, the maximum output from Winston Lee Colliery was about 150,000 tons of coal per year, compared with about 670,000 tons of coal per year for Blundell's Pemberton Colliery. So going on to 1890, the town map, and we can see here the railroad from Winston Lee Colliery is coming down to the pierhead where we see the tippler today. So they would have brought the, the railroad wagons down here and shunted them up and down here, taking the wagons one at a time to tipple the coal into the canal. We still see the pottery yard to the left, but now we begin to see uh, Swan Meadows Inn over here and uh, uh, shortly the development of Swan Meadows Mill and subsequently Eckersley's. This was uh, when Winston Lee Collieries did eventually adopt uh, steam locomotives in 1878. Um, they continued to use the steam locomotives uh, until the dissolution of the collieries in 1820s. This photograph would have been about 1905, one of the Winston Lee Collier steam locomotives called appropriately Winston Lee. So that would have been one of the steam locomotives that brought coal from Winston Lee and uh, used a tippler to empty the coal into the canal barges. So the, the actual railroad to Wigan Pier was owned by the Win Banks's family of Winston Lee and later uh, when the Winston Lee Colliery Company took over from the Banks's, they would have owned the railway. Started uh, 1844 from Banks number one pit and gradually the railroad was extended back up through Baxter Pit and Windy, Har Windy Arbor and ultimately to Leyland Green. The Winston Lee Colliery stopped operating in 1927, which was why, as we know, the Wigan Pier was demolished in 1929. The railroad had been taken up. There was no use for a pier there anymore. So Calderbanks came, took out the old pier and sold it to scrap. Just a quick note on those two other railways that came down to the canal, Germans and Blundell's railways. Uh, Germans railways from Goose Green Newton area, Blundells from Pemberton Collieries, both constructed in the 1825-28 period along Victoria Street with separate terminals either side of the Seven Stars Bridge. That Andy's kindly sent me a photograph uh, the other day. So this is looking from the west side of the Seven Stars Bridge, Gathus being up here, Seven Stars Bridge coming into Wigan. So the German railway would have come down to the canal about here and tippled the coal into the barges here. I remember walking along here maybe five or six years ago, and I don't remember any obvious pier head here. So whether it didn't have an obvious elevated mound and tippler as, as the Wigan Pier that we know, I don't know. On the other side, um, Wigan Pier being up here, looking down to Seven Stars Bridge. This is where the uh, Blundell's Pemberton Coal Railway would have come down to the canal. But again, I can't see any obvious evidence of a, uh, elevated mound or tippler mechanism. So maybe they were all just taken over and modified after the railways closed in the 1860s. So a quick summary of what I talked about, the Douglas navigation uh, was operating in Wigan uh, from about 1741, the Clawton Daglish. And I put Daglish again later because after Doug, John Daglish and Brimlow, who took over the rights for the railway and mining Stonehouse Colliery, Brimlow passed away in 1937. John Daglish took over uh, coal mining developments at Norley Colliery. So this was George Daglish that took over uh, some of the rights uh, of the Stonehouse Colliery. Uh, George de Gleish, as far as I know, was brother of Robert de Gleish that built the York, built the walking horse steam locomotive, and of John de Gleish that 
developed the Stonehouse Colliery. George de Glees was actually a doctor. He 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 got uh, his medical education at St Bart's Hollow in London, but St Bart's Hospital in London. I'm sorry, and he he worked in the Wigan Pharmacy that many of you know about. So the German's pier came down the other side of the canal, Blundell's pier on the south side of the canal. That woodcut viaduct that could be possibly interpreted as the old uh, Wigan Pier was built 1848 and filled in 1890. That overhead tubway uh, from Newton Collieries to Meadow Collieries uh, uh, was operating from 1888 to about 1910. And but the railroad from Wigan Pier from Win to Wigan Pier from Winstonley and the pier itself were demolished by 1929. So finally, I'd just like to see what I, I think is an excellent opportunity for continuing to educate people about Wigan Pier. We know we have a, a large uh, development going on in the Wigan Pier area at the moment. So I propose uh, that we try and see if we can get installed some educational material in one of the buildings about the history of, of, of Wigan Pier. Um, I'm over here, you're over there, so I can't do much about it. But given the fact that the society's main interests are the history and heritage of Wigan, I would hope that there might be some interest in taking this opportunity and contacting the development, uh, the developer.